Hi, everyone. Welcome to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. This is a series hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, along with the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad to have all of you joining us here today. I'm Dr. Anthony Perillo, the Forensic Psychology Training Director here at the University of New Mexico in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. For today's talk, please ask any questions you have of our expert in the Q&A box um, anytime that you feel comfortable. We do hold those until the end. We try our best to get to as many as possible, but oftentimes we get a lot, so just forgive us if we cannot get to yours. Uh, for those of you that are pursuing continuing education credits but are on a tight schedule, you do have to stay for the hour, but do not have to stay longer than that. Um, if we go at the hour, I'll try to let you know when it's passed. Um, we may stay longer to ask address some additional questions. If you are pursuing continuing medical education credits, there will be a sign in in the chat very shortly. And if you're pursuing APA continuing education credits, that link will be posted in the chat box around the last five minutes or so, 55 on the hour. Uh, make sure you open that link before you exit the webinar and make sure you save your certificate after you complete the survey. We don't have access um, and don't keep copies of those uh, certificates of completion after the fact. Um, a recording of this series and a PowerPoint slides will be available probably later today. And as a heads up for next week's talk in the series, we're going to have a discussion on the risk and benefits of having a social media presence as a forensic psychologist. This will feature Dr. David Lay, who is an active social media user, and Dr. Molly Persky, who is not an active social media user. Okay, now it's time for what we've been waiting for for this week's talk. I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, who will be discussing considering sovereign citizen beliefs in competency evals. This is Dr. Anna Feynman. Dr. Feynman was awarded a PhD in clinical psychology with a forensic emphasis from Palo Alto University after completing her pre-doctoral internship with the Ohio Psychology Internships inpatient track at Heartland Behavioral Health. She is most notably a current stellar forensic postdoctoral fellow here at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, where she divides her time between court-ordered competency to stand trial evaluations and policy work. Dr. Feynman began her career in mental health as a marriage and family therapist, working primarily with high acuity children and families. Since switching gears, she's worked with a variety of forensic populations, both on the inpatient and outpatient tracks. Her primary clinical interests are in the areas of risk assessment and management, restoration treatment, and criminal forensic assessment. She also has risk research interests in lone wolf terrorism and hate groups, violence risk assessment, and supervision within the forensic assessment context. Um, Dr. Feynman, Anna, uh, on behalf of us, the University of New Mexico, may say we're excited to have you uh, sharing your expertise with the law and mental health audience. I'll now throw it over to you. Hi. Good morning. I am going to go ahead and just jump right in. We're going to be talking a little bit about the sovereign citizen belief system in competency to stand trial evaluations. Um, yeah. I'm just gonna go ahead and skip through all of the continuing education and certification stuff that Dr. Perlow mentioned, uh, disclosure statement, and a disclaimer statement. All right, so I am going to start by just reminding of the objectives that we will be discussing. And before I jump into those, I just do wanna say that each and every one of these objectives could stand to have an entire hour long session just spent on them. Um, and as my friends, family, and colleagues will attest, I can talk for hours about this topic, but we are just going to keep it short and touch briefly on all three of these. I'm um, going to just briefly provide a brief history on the development of sovereign citizen movements, talk about the difference between original beliefs and also the modern beliefs. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the intersection of sovereign citizen beliefs and mental illness, or lack thereof. And we're going to close up with analyzing the challenges related to the CSP evaluation and restoration um, for those defendants that do identify as part of the sovereign citizen movement. So before I jump in, a couple of things. Um, the next few slides are going to be just a little more information heavy, and that is because I know that these slides will be provided, and I'd like you to be able to use them as a reference if you ever need. Um, Another thing is that reliable information on the sovereign citizen is incredibly difficult to find. There are very few peer-reviewed journals, which I know that we as psychologists and scientists prefer. 
Um, there's some articles, there's a couple of books, a few that just recently came out that I will highlight a little bit later. And then there's also the court documents. And so when we gather information about this group, we really have to reach out to multiple sources. And with that in mind, the biggest source of information is the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, and the Anti-Defamation League. So the Southern Poverty Law Center actually classifies the sovereign citizen movement as a hate group. And so they have them on hate group watch and they regularly update um, information. I'm going to get into that a little bit more um, because it's such a decentralized system that it's a little complex, but um, we'll kind of jump into that a little bit later. And so I really encourage you, if you're looking for information on these folks, you want to look for information outside of our field as well. Sociology, law, and philosophy. Most recently, actually, the Journal of Threat Assessment has had a lot of information. Um, so that, that's sort of where we want to look if we want to get some information. So sovereign citizen defined. Um, so essentially, the it is a variety of anti-government individuals and groups who share some common beliefs and behaviors. Um, and there are, it is a very decentralized group. Um, the, some examples that I have up on the screen, we have the Moorish Nation, we have the AWARE group, and it continues and continues. And it's kind of more a Venn diagram situation where folks are, um, maybe share some beliefs with the sovereign citizen movement and maybe some other ones. And then other groups that don't consider themselves as part of the movement will also intersect and have some of those beliefs. And then there's also unaffiliated individuals. And that can be quite challenging um, just because um, sometimes when you're sitting with an individual that identifies as, as a sovereign citizen, they um, may not be a part of a group and you don't know what kind of questions to ask to really clarify. All right. So overall, the overarching belief of the sovereign citizen is that they believe that they are not under the jurisdiction of the federal government and they consider themselves exempt from US law. Um, I'm just going to pause for one second here. Um, Alex? Yes. The um, presentation that you sent back to me, it does not yeah. have any of my notes in it. Oh, so let, me, to, let me go ahead and get that to you. Then? Yes. Okay. Give me one second. That's what we call a technical faux pas. Um, Okay, Anna, uh, just sent you your email. Go ahead and use that version. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so we'll just be up and running shortly. Um, I'm just picking up where we left off. All right, here we go. 
All right. Thanks for being patient with that, folks. Okay, here we are. All right, so I am going to dive a little bit deeper into the central belief system. Um, and again, this is going to be a little bit of an information heavy slide, um, but I do think it's really important so we can contextualize um, what the belief system is and to understand how we got to where we are now. So the conspiracy is that the US government was replaced. Sovereign citizens believe that the American government that was set up by the founding fathers under the common law legal system was secretly replaced. They basically think that the replacement government swapped out common law for admiralty law, which is the law of sea and international commerce. And here's where we first see the beliefs diverging just a little bit. Um, some folks believe that this happened during the Civil War, and then others believe that this happened in 1933 when the US abandoned the gold standard. And so the, it stands like this. Since 1933, the US dollar has been backed not by gold, but by the full faith and credit of the US government. Um, and according to sovereignty to citizen researchers, the government has pledged its citizenry as collateral by selling their future earner capabilities to foreign investors. And essentially what that did is it effectively enslaved all Americans. And so um, they claim that the sale happens at birth. And the way it happens is when a baby is born in the US, a birth certificate is issued and the hospital usually advises the parents to apply for a social security number pretty immediately. So sovereigns say that the government then uses that birth certificate to set up a corporate trust in the baby's name, which is a secret treasury account. And then it funds that account with amounts ranging anywhere from $600,000 to $20 million. I um, mean, it depends on the particular variant of the sovereign citizen belief um, in terms of that money. And so by setting up this treasury account, the newborn's rights are split and they're held, half of the rights are held by the flesh and blood baby. And then the ones assigned to his or her, his or her corporate shell account. And so the way that they kind of prove this is that since most certificates use all capital letters to spell out the baby's name, that is considered their corporate shell identity, which is also called the straw man identity, while the baby's real flesh and blood name um, is, you know, capitalized at the beginning and then lowercase in the end. Um, and so as the child grows older and most of the legal documents utilize capital letters, we're talking they issue driver's license, marriage license, car registration, criminal court records, even your like TV cable, things like that, and correspondence from the IRS, they all end up pertaining to the shell identity and not their real corporate identity. And so the entire goal of the sovereign citizen is to separate um, and, from their corporate shell and sort of tap into that trade account the government created for them. And the way that it's done is veteran sovereigns will pass on steps to separate from their corporate shell um, and, you know, they file documentation with the Secretary of State, they declare themselves sovereign. The thing you can see a lot of times is instead of signing with their um, signature, they'll sign with an X, or maybe they will use red blood or like, you know, paint thumbprints to sign, um, just to like separate out. Another thing that occasionally folks will engage in is they will um, have their new sovereign identity published in the newspaper to announce it. Um, but yes, the whole goal is to tap into that account and, you know, what ends up happening is that that paperwork really clogs up our legal system. So, like I said, that was a little information heavy, but that's the context. And again, not every sovereign citizen, not every person that identifies as a sovereign citizen holds this exact subsection of beliefs, but that is a bit of an introduction to sort of begin understanding. And so in the context of our presentation here, a straw man is the government identity and the lawful being is that individual's free identity. And so you'll hear that language. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but that language is what you really wanna watch out for when you're trying to identify if you're sitting with a person who holds these beliefs. I did also briefly want to point out some criminal activities that folks engage in in the sovereign citizen group. So for the most part, all sorts of fraud, bank fraud, mail fraud, wire fraud, tax fraud, um, I could go on, uh, money laundering, all sorts of money related 
schemes. Um, I have felonious police killings on there. That is not common, but it has happened. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, conspiracy. So again, this list is just for your reference. It's not exhaustive by any means, but it does include some of the more common choices. Um, all right. And so now I just want to bring to your attention a few infamous examples, um, again, to help contextualize what we're talking about here. So the first example, the first person I wanted to discuss is Terry Nichols. Um, I would guess that there are folks that weren't alive during this um, bombing in 1994. So I'm just going to briefly mention uh, the Oklahoma City bombing was a domestic terrorist truck bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, oh, sorry, in 1995, not 94. And it was perpetrated by two anti-government extremists, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. And Terry Nichols was a professed sovereign citizen. And, you know, 168 people were killed, more than 700 were injured. It was a pretty serious deal. Um, but that is one of the most famous earlier ones that I could find that people maybe still are aware of. And then more recently in 2010, Jerry and Joe Kane. So this was another very serious case of, um, it's a father-son team of sovereigns they were pulled over in West Memphis, Arkansas for a routine traffic stop, and they murdered two police officers um, with some of the assault rifles that they had in the back of their uh, car. Also, oh, about that. Also in 2010, Joseph Sack, um, he flew his single engine plane into a IRS office building, and, um, you know, he, he did talk he, he sort of posted a lengthy rant on his social media against the agency uh, about tax debt and things like that. Um, and, you know, in a separate sort of um, aspect of that, he did set his home on fire the same morning. And so um, there's another sort of infamous example of sovereign citizens who did turn to violent behavior. And then last but not least, not as infamous, but perhaps more famous, Wesley Snipes, who is a, an actor. He wrote a 600-page statement to IRS in response to some conspiracy charges that were filed where he claimed a false tax refund. And really, the long and short of it was that in 2008, he was sentenced to three years in a federal prison. Um, he was convicted he, for willfully failing to file his tax returns, and he was released in 2013. There is more information about that online as well, if you are interested. Okay, so that was a little bit of an introduction and I'm going to just shift gears a little bit and talk about sovereign citizens and mental illness before we jump in. Um, and I talk about this a little bit more later. There is an intersection, not all sovereign citizens are mentally ill and there are some more sovereign citizens that are, that are, and this section is just to help kind of differentiate and point us into a direction where we can really parse out um, what's what when we are sitting with these folks in our offices. Okay, so a few things here. For those unfamiliar with the sovereign citizen movement, um, and I'm gonna tell on myself a little bit here, I grew up in an area where the sovereign citizen movement when I lived there was not big. It was not common. I had never, in the eight years that I was doing mental health work, I had never sat with anybody who espoused these beliefs. And so um, when I ended up moving to a different part of the country where that's more prominent, I had no idea what I was looking at. And so for those unfamiliar with the movement, some of the behavior, some of the statements made can seem a little bit bizarre and confusing. And, you know, for those of us trying to look out for it, mental illness. And um, something that I always think about is if individuals that are trained in mental health are looking at differentials like schizophrenia spectrum or bipolar with psychotic features, maybe even looking at personality disorders, if we're having these thoughts about these folks, I would imagine that lawyers and judges and other courtroom functionaries may also have some trouble with understanding what may be happening when these folks present in our criminal justice system. Um, I'm going to do a little plug here. Uh, it's in my references, but Raman and colleagues, 2021, 
uh, they wrote a article on personality assessment in extreme overvalued beliefs, which I think is definitely worth a look. And I'll, I'll mention it a little bit later. Um, but there are very few, like I said, specifically peer-reviewed articles on mental illness and sovereign citizens. And the ones that do exist, they tend to talk, like they're more case studies. Um, and I think that's because even though um, the movement at this point, approximately, we're at about 500,000 folks nationwide. Again, that's such an approximation because folks do try to shy away from any kind of government institution. So it's not like there's a census out there that really captures it. But um, it's still really difficult to find enough individuals to get a high end for a peer reviewed article. And so with that being said, um, I kind of want to spend a little bit of time just reviewing um, what we see. And something that is maybe like the first thought that some of us have when we're sitting with an individual who's espousing some of these beliefs and thoughts is um, that they might be talking about a delusion. And the DSM-5-TR um, defines a delusion as a fixed belief that is not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. Um, they go on to talk about the distinction between delusion and strongly held ideas and saying that, you know, they're a little difficult to determine, but ultimately depend on the degree of conviction with which that belief is held, even if there is contradictory evidence regarding its veracity or truth. Um, and so, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that cultural context is incredibly important here. We have to consider folks religiosity, any sort of supernatural beliefs, right? Individuals who have experienced torture or persecution or political violence and discrimination, right? All of that is contextually important when we're hearing somebody's story. Having said that though, when we think about extreme overvalued beliefs, right, it's usually a shared phenomenon, right? Shared in a person's cultural, religious, or maybe subcultural group, community. Um, it's relished, it's amplified. Um, and it's really defended by the, the possessor of the belief. Um, but again, it's kind of hard sometimes to differentiate between a delusion or an obsession. Um, and something that Raman and colleagues talk about is that this belief, it grows more dominant and more refined and more resistant to challenge. And this intense emotional commitment to this belief across this group of individuals uh, may end up carrying out violent behavior in its service. Um, and, you know, that goes back to the slide that I just talked about, some infamous examples where violence was perpetrated and a lot of people got hurt. Um, Sometimes the belief can also become binary and simplistic and absolute. Um, and those are all considerations that we need to sort of keep in mind as professionals. I would be absolutely remiss if I did not mention Cunning, uh, Dr. Cunningham's work, um, his 2018 article, which talks about a structured professional judgment that can help in determining, sort of trying to tease out and differentiate between a delusion and a strongly held belief. Um, Dr. Cunningham did a presentation for LMH, uh, I think last year and talked about this at length and it was excellent. And I found his sort of the structure that he created within this to be really um, helpful when sitting with a defendant or a patient that is espousing this belief, but may also be showing some sort of um, delusional belief as well. And without going too far into it, um, you know, he look, encourages us to look at like the cognitive style and content of the belief. Like, what are they believing and how is it believed? What are the repercussions? Is it shared by social influences, right? And is it integrated in the productive community that the person belongs to? Um, and also to look at symptomatology. Um, were there any uh, indications of emerging psychosis, any sort of disturbances that accompany this belief? Um, like I said, I highly recommend checking out that article if you're in that situation where you're sitting with this defendant and it, it kind of becomes unclear. So I just spent all this time talking about differentiating between folks who have a mental illness or who espouse sovereign citizen beliefs. And what I want to jump into now is actually bringing up an example from my own work of an individual who had strongly held sovereign citizen beliefs, considered him a part himself a part of the movement, and also a presented with a diagnosable mental illness. 
So I am going to just briefly talk about LM, a little bit of background information on our friend LM. He was 59 years old when I met him. He is a, identified as a white cisgender heterosexual man who was born and raised in a very rural uh, county of a Midwestern state. Um, now, I also do recognize that statutes are different across states. And so this journey that he went on might be a little bit different than what happens in your state. But I think this still gives a pretty good picture of what, um, what we're looking at here. So his restoration journey, he was charged with two counts of felonious assault, which is a felony two in this particular state. Um, question of competence was raised by his attorney. And um, he was sent to a state forensic facility for a 20 day evaluation, which is just like the initial evaluation. And the evaluator at the state forensic facility found him to be incompetent to stand trial, but restorable. And the way the statute is written in this particular state, um, he was to go through six months of restoration, then to be evaluated again. And then if he was still found um, incompetent but restorable, he could do another six months, just given the severity of his crime. And that's exactly what happened. After the first six months, he was found incompetent to stand trial, but still restorable. And then after a six months, additional six months of restoration, he was um, found competent and was able to continue on his journey and engage in his trial process. And so I want to throw out just a couple of con uh, cultural considerations that are important based on what we discussed. Um, so he was adamant that the crime occurred on sovereign lands. What I mean by that is that he owned this property. And in fact, I think this property was owned by his family on uh, for a while. And so for that reason, the US government has no right to detain him, especially since he doesn't find them to be a valid government. Um, the other interesting wrinkle, so he was charged with assault. What happened was he hit a family member in the head with a frying pan, might've been a cast iron pan, something like that. Um, there was hospitalization involved. Um, the police came and talked to the victim and things like that. But then a couple months later, the victim actually went in and attempted to recant her statement and the police were essentially like look like charges are still being brought like this thing is still happening and so those are two specific sort of lines of thought that he was really stuck on the entire time um, that we spent time with him and so some mental health considerations with our friend Ellen here so the diagnosis that he ultimately ended up with was bipolar two with psychotic features. And I want to just take a few of his symptoms that he presented with um, and really just contextualize them. So we were fortunate and I recognize that, um, you know, sometimes when we're doing evaluations, we really have like five hours to talk to the person or two hours or however long you might have. And you don't get to see them across time, which presents its own sort of challenge. Um, but in this case, we were able to observe this individual for a year, um, which gave us like a really good indication of what, how he functions in the world, um, or at least how he functions in a law facility. And so when he had increased manic symptoms, he would espouse his beliefs to anybody who would listen. We offered restoration groups, and by offered, I mean they were basically required, um, and he would attend group and um, when answering a question about, you know, how should you behave in the courtroom or what, you know, how should you speak to your lawyer, whatever it may be, he would begin to go on these really long winded rants and it, it felt like he could not help himself like he could not stop. And even when people in his group would say things like, hey, man, you know, the right answer, just like, let us move on or like, hey, if you want to get out of here, you know, that right answer, just say it. Um, he wasn't able to regulate that like impulsivity and that need to keep talking. Um, and so he would sometimes walk out of group or we would have to ask him out because he was just going on and on about um, what, you know, his beliefs were and things like that. He'd be awake for days working on puzzles. Um, but if you, if you tried to speak with him, he would just be very irritated. And again, question your legitimacy as part of that kind of government system and talked about a lot of delusions of persecution, but again, really difficult to tease apart, right? Is this 
is he delusional or is this part of his belief system that he holds true at all times? Um, but then to notice that when his manic symptoms decreased, even though his beliefs, he continued to verbalize his beliefs, he was able to sit through group. He was able to give the right answer. Um, you know, I, I probably should have been careful about um, putting the words fake good on a presentation aimed at a bunch of forensic psychologists and people who think about malingering. But what I really mean here is he was able to pretend and answer questions in a way that he knew would be advantageous to him, even though he still held those beliefs. Um, and, you know, he was a really good example of somebody who really held on to those sovereign citizen systemic beliefs and also um, had a diagnosable mental illness. And, and for that reason, it was really difficult to determine. And I'm going to get into this more in just a second as to like which parts were maybe a little bit more challenging. Overall though, was something I want to sort of have to be a take home point. Not a lot of literature out there, but it does exist. And the existing literature suggests that most sovereign citizens are not mentally ill and are in fact competent to stand trial. So I know that I just spent 10 minutes talking about an example of somebody who is, but that is an exception and not the rule necessarily. Um, okay, switching gears into our last objective. I just briefly would like to touch upon um, the general criteria for CST. This is structured after how we do it in New Mexico because that is where I currently am. Um, and so you'll notice there's an extra prong, but overall you'll be able to see how this maps onto the dusky standard. Um, so first prong, the rational and factual understanding of proceedings against. Next, the ability to consult with a lawyer to a reasonable degree of rational understanding and then capacity to assist in defense. And then that bottom one is specific to New Mexico, although I do believe that several other states also um, talk about this, but uh, capacity to comprehend reasons for punishment. So again, you can see how this maps on the desk, and I just wanted to give like a brief review before we hopped into um, the information that is relevant to consideration for competency to stand trial. So briefly, I want to talk about two key court cases. And um, really, what I, what I really want to highlight in these court cases is the language. And so in US versus Cordell, uh, a defendant was found incompetent to stand trial after a brief examination by a psychiatrist. That psychiatrist found him to be paranoid and delusional. After, and so the defendant made statements to the court and he talked about secured party and creditor status relative to the government and corporate fiction. Um, he submitted a letter to the court where he talked about conditional acceptance for value or proposed settlement of the case of the commercial party. So when we hear words like that, that should be a little red flag like, oh, that sounds like a sovereign citizen belief of some sort and needs to be considered in that context. And so the psychiatrist was actually asked to do a more comprehensive evaluation of the defendant. And again, he said, look, this person is evidencing a thought disorder. He's got paranoid and delusional and grandiose thinking. Um, and it would interfere with his ability to assist his counsel in his defense. And so the defendant was subsequently actually evaluated by a BOP psychologist who administered some tests. Um, and he found that the defendant did not have a mental disease or defect. And in fact, when the psychologist, the BOP psychologist was asked to testify, he had, um, he actually testified that he was familiar with sovereign citizens and had previously evaluated a good number of adherents and found that such defend defendants do not necessarily have a mental disease. And so this speaks further to the idea that once you learn or you notice and start recognizing these terms, it'll be easier to to see what you're looking at um, when you are evaluating folks. Um, in US versus Hall, which was just a year later, kind of in the same vein, defendant was charged with possession of cocaine with intent to distribute, and he had been ordered to undergo an evaluation, um, but the forensic psychologist who evaluated and later testified had seen this and um, kind of summed up by saying that the defendant did not have a uh, mental disorder and that, that that was part of his defense strategy 
but it is not based in confused or delusional thinking. And so the court came out with a whole opinion and talked about how, um, you know, since the defendant exhibited organized, rational, sequential, and coherent thought, um, what it really is, is, is a pattern of non-cooperative and frivolous motions that continued from earlier in his lifetime, and that folks are now using that as a defense strategy. Um, and so I specifically wanted to highlight these cases because they're using those words, those like magic indicative words of, um, you know, conditional acceptance for value, secured party, creditor status relative to the government, all those words are indicators for, for what we might be um, kind of seeing, right? So with that said, I sort of want to jump into beliefs that might be relevant to stand uh, to competency to stand trial evaluation. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, I would never claim otherwise, but just some things for us to think about as this population grows and as we um, begin to see more of these folks in our offices. So, and what I did was I, uh, I'm i gonna discuss briefly the belief and then in the lighter font, I have where it might come up during your interview for um, competence to stand trial. So common law, right? Um, essentially, no court can deprive the citizen of common law rights with regard to property. And sovereign citizens believe that the common law derived from the American Revolution, which freed the colonists from the British monarchy and made each colonist sovereign over his own property. And so basically, under their definition of common law, no court ruling or government state or regulation can deprive a citizen of any of their common law rights. And this is particularly with regards to property. So if you're if you're seeing somebody with regards to a crime that either occurred on their private property or has to do with private property, um, you know, something to consider that some of the ways in which they espouse this belief might fall under some of the questions that you're asking when you're trying to determine someone's understanding of the proceedings. All right, and now, 14th Amendment, right? Um, we all know what, what the 14th Amendment is, uh, but to sovereign citizens, the way that they read it is that the 14th Amendment um, shifted all those Americans from the status of being citizens of individual states to being a citizen of this corporate entity, which is the federal government. But they believe that this change in status can only occur if the citizen voluntarily agrees to give up all those rights. And the way that you give up those rights is by seeking a license, paying your taxes, holding a social security number, so all of those things. And so they're out there revoking driver's licenses and social security numbers and trying to become immune to the judicial system and state and federal government. Um, so this is, a, this is an interesting point too, because I think that this could pop up when you're evaluating for capacity to aid in their defense and understanding of the proceedings. And again, if we're not familiar with the language that these folks are using, it can sound like something it's not and really, you know, ultimately change your opinion. Um, additionally, there is a whole missing 13th Amendment belief. I won't get into it too much, but only to say that in that folks who believe in that, they believe that lawyers are nobility and aren't legal citizens. And so you could imagine how that could interact or interfere with their ability to consult successfully with counsel or at least appear as though they do. Little side note, um, some folks are pretty insistent on self-representation. Um, and I know some of our colleagues are finding themselves doing um, competency to represent self-representation or however um, your state and statute refers to that. And that's another wrinkle that I'm not going to get into here, but something worth considering. Um, let's see. And then office of person. So this is a variation kind of on that idea that the government has conspired to prevent the citizens from being free uh, men and women. So the long and short of it is that sovereign citizens will argue that because the statutory definition of a person does not include man or woman, criminal statutes will only apply to people who hold government office. 
And so then the government will appoint people to the office of person through licenses and permits and state benefits. And basically what all of that means is that then people by answering questions of state office holders are accepting this authority rather than rejecting it. Um, and so that goes for government officials, judges, attorneys, police, other bureaucrats, and um, they will not answer those questions posed by these individuals. Something to consider a lot of the times as evaluators are we are seen whether rightfully or not as part of that system and um, that can really interfere with our interviewing of defendants if they believe that. And so I threw it under all three prongs because I think that it could come up under all three. Um, it doesn't really necessarily um, have to, but something to just think about. And it's not the end all be all. And like I said, there are many other beliefs. Something that I think could be really useful, there is a book that I've referenced at the end there um, that is called Sovereign Citizens, a Psychological and Criminal Analysis. And um, she has an entire chapter on um, behavior in court and what that might look like and how that might appear. Definitely worth a read if you have a chance. And so really we wanna look at some competency to stand trial considerations. Really what can be really helpful is familiarity with core beliefs and basic tenets. Like I said, I so briefly and so quickly went through the development and the beliefs and you know where we're kind of at. And um, just even knowing a little bit of that and those key words to look for can really aid in accurate evaluation of competency. Um, and you know, it's worth saying that in many instances at this point, especially in um, states where it's more prominent, sovereign citizens are recognized in courtrooms and competency isn't even raised. There was an interesting study that I also threw in the references at the back where um, there was a study conducted in Indiana and very few courts raised competency for sovereign citizens and no rural county courts because again, they're familiar, they know what they're looking at. So that greater familiarity is what makes it less likely. And not only that, but judges have been even dismissing cases in order to prevent that waste of resources that sovereign citizens are so well known for. Um, like I mentioned briefly, behavior in court. Sovereign citizens are known for their problematic behavior in court. Uh, they can be obstinate, argumentative, antagonistic, confrontational, disruptive, and for evaluators of competency, that is, you know, always something that we know and something that we discuss. Um, so just another consideration to throw in there. I also think it's important to remember the importance the importance of collateral information. Um, I think anytime we talk about um, forensic evaluations or just you know psych evaluations in general, collateral is brought up. You want to talk to family and friends. Um, our friend LM from earlier, his entire family, based on his report, his entire family is uh, part of that sovereign citizen movement. And he has been in it for a very long time. But then we also see folks who are um, younger and maybe brand new to it and maybe just getting started and, and how different it is when someone's belief system is deeply sunken in versus just like a shadow or a, a new belief that they haven't fully actualized into yet. And so this can be a really important conversation to have. We want to look at previous hospitalizations. Did somebody ever bring up this question before? And of course, previous forensic evaluation. Like I mentioned in those two court cases, um, especially in the 2011 one, somebody who is less familiar may have evaluated this person and found them to have some sort of delusional disorder um, and have described it. And those descriptions can be helpful to even compare to what you're seeing now. Now we know competency is about the present moment, but this information can be very helpful regardless. Um, what we really want to see as well is we want to think about capacity versus volition, which I think is a basic tenet of CST evaluations anyway. Um, you know, can this person be, uh, can this person hit all the prompts? Can they be calm? Can they talk to their counsel? Can they assist in their own defense? What part of it is volitional and what part of it is the capacity? 
And I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a uh, mic drop there at the end. Um, I know that some states require, or some jurisdictions, I should say, is probably more accurate requiring diagnosis. Um, but I think as a field, we are shifting away from like pure DSM-5 precise diagnoses and into a description of what we're seeing symptomatologically. And I think that this is where that can be really, really helpful, whichever way you decide to go, whether you find somebody competent or incompetent or however that goes. Um, the last thing I want to mention, uh, sovereign citizen movement is growing. We are seeing them in places where they're not typically seen. And like I said, at Pat last count, it was around 500,000, but that was in 2018, 2019. Um, and so it's important, I think, to be on the lookout and to sort of pay attention to what we might see. And last but not least, I have some references that you'll be able to check out if you're looking for my slides later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, Dr. Feynman, for um, what has what has proven for sure to be a, a, a fascinating topic for uh, for the audience here. We have a series of questions here. And I'm sure they'll keep uh, they'll keep coming in. If you have any additional questions for Dr. Feynman, you can put them in the Q and A box, and we'll get to as many as we can here for the next uh, ten or fifteen minutes or so. Um, for for people that are a little bit less familiar with competency evaluations specifically, can you can you clarify when you talk about restoration what that actually is and what that entails? Yes. So again, it depends on jurisdiction. Different states have different programs. And so what restoration is, um, I'm going to just talk about kind of in the context of um, in a forensic state hospital is it is programming that often includes psychiatric services, medications, things like that, group therapy or individual therapy if it's indicated, and also restoration classes. And so what I was uh, referencing with LM is they would have a required hour a day in which they would have to attend and learn about how the court works, um, sort of in the hope of educating folks, making sure that they're really prepared for that next evaluation and to go through trial. Um, and so when I talk about restoration services, that's what I'm referencing in particular. Um, and specifically, I'm talking about that group modality where you even have your um, fellow group members telling you, hey, man, you know the right answer, just say it. And the, the individual is maybe just not able to because of their level of dysfunction. So several people have, um, are, are curious about some of the nature around sovereign citizen beliefs. So I might throw a couple of questions on the beliefs themselves and all that about uh, to you or the context for them. <laughs> uh, sure. So, so one question was, is there is there a, a mandate or anything within the belief system that precludes these individuals from divulging more information about the secret, no, uh, the movement? In other words, is it meant to be a secretive uh, movement? So I am going to preface my answer by saying that it is such, and I know I've said this multiple times, but it is such a decentralized system with so many different offshoots and by their nature they're sort of anti the whole like hierarchy thing um, and also the whole like telling people what to do thing and so um, sometimes you will find that people won't talk about it but other times um, they'll tell anybody who listen because all in the service of trying to separate and gain access to that trust and to their real identity in this drama and world that they believe in. And so while you may find that some of them are secretive, you'll also find that a lot of them are pretty loud about it and will fire, file paperwork and take out ads in the newspaper and tell everybody who will listen, like, hey, we got to separate. We, we can't tolerate this enslavement any longer. Do you know if there's any intersection between sovereign citizens and the Freemasons? This person says they, they had a case where a defendant wanted to use their money from various shell corporations to buy their way out of a serious charge and enlisted the insistence of their Freemason chapter to try to secure that money. Oh, I you know what? I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, that sounds legit, though. That sounds like a real thing. Um, what an interesting case to have. Uh, but that languaging that you just used in your question, I'm sorry, I don't have access to it, but the shell corporation language and like using that money that exists somewhere else really makes me think that this person believes in at least a few of the sovereign citizen beliefs. 
how would how would you approach a defendant who reports that they they're Moorish American and they report beliefs that are kind of consistent here, but they reject the classification of being a sovereign citizen? Yeah. So um, I don't think that I addressed that because of my technical snafu, and I really should have. Um, the sovereign citizen belief system and in, in its initial sort of beginning stages was a pretty racist and anti-Semitic system. And so folks who are of the Moorish belief and identify as Black Americans from that belief will often reject some of the sovereign citizen beliefs because um, there is a lot of anti-Blackness and racism in that belief. So absolutely, there will be, you know, it, like I said earlier, I think that's helpful to think of as a Venn diagram. Certain beliefs intersect and others don't. I hope that, I don't know if I answered that question, but I hope I did. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Um, someone asks, is, is the bottom line with all this that an individual with an entrenched belief in sovereign, sovereign citizenry that does not have a mental illness diagnosis that has contributed significantly to this belief or is the cause of this belief would typically be deemed competent to stand trial. So, I mean, yeah, you basically summed the whole thing up in a sentence. That's awesome. Yes, essentially, for the most part, having this fixed belief is not enough for somebody to be incompetent to stand trial, again, because of that volitional piece. I think the answer to your question is yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so with that in mind, somebody asks about additional advice, um, given that it seems important to determine then whether these beliefs are due to mental illness or just due to something else, recommendations for teasing out the distinction. Yeah, you know, I really relied on Dr. Cun Dr. Cunningham's work. I, just the way that that was written was so helpful to me um, to kind of start teasing out. Um, and I think, you know, and I said this earlier, we don't always have the luxury of seeing somebody over time the way we would in a forensic state hospital, uh, but that's always, always a helpful thing. Um, when you're, if your um, defendant has been medicated for some sort of, maybe with some sort of antipsychotic or whatever else, does the level at which they espouse this belief and hold true, does it change, right? Like, because if you're a sovereign citizen, you have that belief system, and antipsychotic isn't going to change your basic belief system. Um, but espousing sort of, sort of these delusional beliefs, antipsychotics might temper that a little bit. Um, the answer to your question is, it's really hard and really, yeah, it's, it's just really challenging. And there's not as many resources that for that as we would like. But again, I found Dr. Cunningham's article to be really helpful with like just even conceptualizing. Um, how we can go about that. Do you have any suggestions on how to identify patients that might be malingering sovereign citizen beliefs in their attempts to be found not competent? Well, I think that the, you know, it's important to go back to the root of the matter. Like we just said that somebody who espouses sovereign citizen beliefs is not necessarily incompetent and in fact more of the time more times than not they are competent and I you know and I don't have any scientific basis for what I'm about to say I'm just saying what I've done in the past I've just given it to them straight having this belief system isn't going to make me think that you're delusional if you're trying to malinger just say it straight out um, but no I have I don't think I've been doing this long enough to give you a better answer than that but something to think about so, so kind of getting back to that, that core message of like, if it's just the sovereign beliefs that might not be uh, sufficient to be found not competent. Um, this is, this seems like sort of the explain it like I'm five kind of question, maybe not that severe, but I'll get to that part. Um, I've had a couple, this person asked, I have a couple of cases uh, and attorneys have had difficulty grasping how a client can be competent when their beliefs seem so delusional and that the client will not cooperate with counsel. Any tips on how to educate an attorney about these differences? Yeah, um, so I am a big fan of footnotes and citations in my competency evals. I know that that can be a little bit of a 
um, controversial sort of decision. I know some folks who are not about that. I have found that referencing like bodies of work. And so there's a couple of um, more informational references here in my um, presentation. And just sort of um, summarizing that information and then putting a citation down and just explaining it exactly the way we just talked about um, in a short paragraph. I know we're all trying to do shorter evaluations and more accessible, but something like this really could use an explanation. And especially if you have an attorney who's never experienced this before, you might have to explain it a little bit more than you would otherwise. Um, but it's like everything else. A lot of what we do, I think, as forensic evaluators is about education. Um, and this is not different. Yeah, speaking of um, speaking of sometimes this this message of clear communication here, um, do do sovereign citizens actually call themselves sovereign citizens, or is that a label that we have we have given them? I have experienced folks calling themselves sovereign citizens, and it is actually a label that some of these individuals carry with a lot of pride. I mean, remember they think that we are all sheeple following a government that is illegitimate, you know, and and they're not. They're doing their thing. They're trying to access their money. They're trying to live a free life. And so they carry it with a lot of pride. Um, again, all of these answers I'm giving probably aren't true for every single sovereign citizen out there, but this has just been my experience. Absolutely. And as you highlighted, there's very, very little out there um, of looking at sovereign citizens as a group. Um, a lot of anecdote after anecdote after anecdote. Um, do you know of any research with that in mind uh, about different types of characteristics or symptoms that appear more common among people that endorse these sovereign citizen beliefs? So because the studies that do exist overwhelmingly have, have discussed individuals who are sovereign citizens but don't have a mental illness, so essentially what it is, is it was like an archival sort of situation where they looked at people's um, criminal history and CST evaluations and all that stuff to determine, hey, like, did the sovereign citizen have a mental illness or what was going on with them? And overwhelmingly, they were found not to have it. So like I said, because of that, there's very little research. Um, I'm going to ponder that. And if you want to send me an email, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that further because I want to give it sort of the weight it deserves. Um, but yeah, email me and I'll, I'll see what I can find for you. Are your, uh, I, I can't remember right now. Are your, is your email address on the slides that, oh. um, they'll be getting out? What a great question. I think it might not be, but I will make it available. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. Um, I'm noticing here several people have since asked if, um, if you're aware of any spikes or increasing claims of sovereign citizenship particularly since the uh, January 6th insurrection attempt? I think what I would like to say is that there has been generally a spike in extremist beliefs in the last few years, and sovereign citizen extremist beliefs are part of that trend. Um, the, the case examples that you brought up, um, I assume were, were exclusively men. Um, any, any anecdotes or experience regarding women who identify as sovereign citizens? You know, I have, I have not encountered a woman who identifies as a sovereign citizen, but it's worth mentioning that LM's family member that he had perpetrated the attack on identifies as a sovereign citizen. So this is not a strictly male um, belief system. Every example that I have read about or seen was, um, I would not try to speculate as to why that might be. Do you know where the term straw man comes from in this context? You know, I'm fairly certain I read about it and I cannot recall right now. Um, but I imagine it's something akin to the fact that like how the straw falls apart maybe. Mm -hmm. But I will, I will, you know what, that's a good thing for me to know in the future. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, I am bearing through the sheer number of questions. People have uh, had a lot of, a lot of input, a lot of different comments. So somebody just added that there's data through the Southern Poverty and Law Center about an increase in the number of hate groups and sovereign citizen uh, movement has seemed that's to increase. Accurate. 
Yeah. And Southern Poverty Law Center is an excellent tool. They do a lot of tracking um, and just to kind of keep your pulse, your finger on the pulse of what you might see coming into your office that maybe you're not as familiar with. I, I look at their stuff maybe like once every couple months in that for that reason. So, so we are we are at the top of the hour. So I'll just throw out one gets back to a more of a forensic -y kind of question here that was asked that touches on some of the things we have here before. Um, if we if we agree that these are irrational beliefs and these beliefs affect their defense, how do we then say the person can rationally assist their attorney in their defense and find them competent to stand trial? I think I would argue against it being an irrational belief specifically that language, because at its core, by definition, if you believe the things that they believe, they, they would say that it is a rational belief. Um, but I hear what you're saying. Um, let me think about how I want to answer this. It's hard to answer because I think everybody's presentation is so different you might find that a person will be willing to, hey, like to say, hey, I believe this, but I know that to get through trial in this jurisdiction that I don't think is a legitimate jurisdiction, I have to say A, B, C, and X, Y, Z, right? And you would write that report differently than if the person was so entrenched that they were not able. And then that would bring into question, like what is behind that entrenchment? Why is it that specific and so immovable? Don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I I think the the straightforward context, if you were in most states, was that in most states the nexus, the jurisdiction would require presentation of a mental illness or defect under the law. And if you're not saying this is entrenched within a mental illness, then it wouldn't apply. Us being in a state where that is not required makes this a little bit more a little bit more complicated, where you're trying to demonstrate. Um, that this isn't an inability um, yeah. to, exactly. to then assist in the council yeah, that right. prevents them from rationally assisting. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But just like I think everything in this, so many times I've had to answer a question in this field by saying it depends. And I think that it really, really depends. Well, Dr. Feynman, Anna, um, thank you for, uh, for a fascinating discussion and a not very conversed or researched area that can very well come across to a lot of the audience here, anybody that uh, is representing somebody or does a, does a competency evaluation, um, provided a well of knowledge that I'm sure many will um, find helpful. Um, that is that is a wrap for this week's Law and Mental Health series. Um, stay tuned next week when we have Drs. David Lay and Molly Persky who will be discussing the risks and benefits of having a social media presence as a forensic psychologist. Um, hope to see you then and have a fantastic rest of your week.